All right, we're going to get started. How's everyone doing out there? You guys good? Thank you so much for coming. My name is Christian Henry, and I'm the President and Chief Executive Officer of PacBio. How many of you guys got to attend our party last night? Yeah, that was, that, was, uh, that was really something. I tell you what, I had such a good time. It was so much fun to connect with all of you. Today, we're going to try to get deeper into the weeds on our, our big announcements from last night. Uh, but, you know, I, before we get started, I got a couple housekeeping things. Uh, we're going to go straight through, so we have a full hour of content. And so uh, for Q&A, we will be hanging around right after, and you can also catch us in the booth, so just, um, just so you guys know. I also, we want to welcome uh, Dr. Stacy Gabriel, Chief Genomics Officer at the Broad Institute. She's here, as well as Aziz al uh, this, I always have a hard time with this. Al Kafaji, the Associate Director of Methods Development, he's here to give us a talk uh, as well. So super excited about that. But let me just kick it off and remind everyone that we're a public company and legal people ask us to write really big things in small fonts. Um, so just feel free to refer to our, uh, our SEC filings if, uh, if you want to learn more about the company. As I said last night, and I continue to say, we are driven, our North Star is driven by our mission of enabling the promise of genomics to bettering human health. Uh, and we do this through you guys. We want to make it crystal clear. We develop the technology so that you can make the discoveries so that you can change the world. We want to be the engine behind you every step of the way in partnership. And, and I think that's a really important um, mentality to start as a technology company, you know, trying to put the, the, the community first. Uh, and that's something we're really trying to do. Hopefully, everyone got a bit of a taste of that last night, because I, I do think building this community in the post-COVID era is a really, uh, a really important thing for us to do. And we want to be some of the leaders along the way. We are growing. We've grown. Since I've joined as a CEO, we've doubled the size of our company. We have almost 800 people now, 200 people uh, supporting the commercial organization. So basically supporting you, our partners and customers every single day. Uh, all around the world, we've expanded our footprint globally. So now we have offices in each of the major geographies around the world. Uh, I was just at our new London uh, facility just a few weeks ago. And we have a great uh, applications lab there. So hopefully some of you that are, that are uh, in Europe can have the opportunity to spend some time with the team there uh, and support your research. We, have, uh, we, we do have an extensive I IP portfolio, which is really the bedrock of some of these products that we've created. And I'm going quick, because I know you guys want to hear all the fun stuff, if I can make this work. Oh, there we go. So if we kind of click through the timeline, we were founded in 2000 and we developed, you know, with the whole notion of how can we develop single molecule sequencers with high resolution. Uh, and using the semiconductor technology, we started with the RS2 system and moving through the SQL. So the first part from 2000 to 2020 when I joined, it was the RS2, the SQL 1, and the SQL 2 that really started powering our growth. And then when I joined the company, we kind of went on a new mission, a new strategy to accelerate product development and drive, uh, and drive the state of the art even further, yet still leveraging our semiconductor technology. And so over the last uh, several quarters, we've made, we've made some significant changes to the company and our strategy. First, we were able to uh, raise, uh, raise some significant capital so that we could expand and serve you better and drive innovation faster. We continue to make progress with our hi-fi uh, hi chemistry and capabilities, and we're seeing that in the field. The SQL 2E today is performing better than it's ever performed its, in its entire life, and we're going to continue to keep working on these platforms because we do think, even in light of the new uh, announcements last night, that SQL 2E still has a place in our portfolio. In the third quarter, we acquired Omnium, which is where we've where we acquired our SVB, or sequencing by binding chemistry. We'll talk some more about that. Really excited to acquire. A lot of people ask me questions, why would you do that? And the reality is, is that we believe that we can um, 
develop highly differentiated technologies to answer, answer questions rather than try to create a, a one-size-fits-all sequencer to solve all problems. And I think that's a really important um, way of thinking. It allows us to really come and, and solve, help you solve whatever problem you're trying to solve with the best technology for that solution. And then we've been launching uh, you know, new kits uh, and continue to improve our workflows. And then, of course, last night we announced, uh, we announced our, our new product portfolio that we're so excited to share with you some more today. And so with that, I want to uh, invite Dave Miller. Dave Miller is our Vice President of Marketing and really uh, one of the architects behind all of this. So let's give it up for Dave. Thank you, Christian. Thank you all for coming. Um, this is a packed house, which is <laughs> truly amazing. And I'm honored to uh, get the opportunity to share what we've been working on uh, at Pack Bio for the last couple of years now and really bring forth the combination of some pretty amazing work across the company. So I thought to sort of kick us off, I really just wanted to take us back and say, you know, what are the areas that we are focused on? What are we trying to do at Pack Bio that we believe will really help enable genomics, enable this community to go on and make beautiful and amazing discoveries. And so to me, it sort of comes down to three things. The, the first is that, as Christian alluded to, we really want to continue to expand and improve HIFA-based workflows. So how do we keep adding those applications? How do we keep enabling new applications to come into HIFA? And we'll do that through partnerships. We'll do that through internal development. And I'll talk a little bit about the work that we've been doing on that front to really keep making HIFA the data type of choice for answering so many of these biological questions. The second thing I want to sort of go through is our new uh, sequencing by binding chemistry and our product uh, that we announced last night, which is truly fantastic. And I see many of the development team in the back of the room, hello Brittany, um, who've done an amazing job in bringing this to market. And so it'll be really fun to go through and share some of the, the data that we're actually seeing and talk through why we really believe that accuracy matters and what you can do with that when it comes to answering these biological questions. And then finally, I'm going to wrap up and talk about what I think most people are, are certainly excited about, which is answering those two big requests that you've had as a community for us at PacBio around how do we make hi-fi sequencing more affordable and more scalable so you can take on the projects you want and really think about answering those questions. So to come back a little bit, we, we mentioned hi-fi, and I just want to make sure that everyone sort of understands what we're talking about, the importance of hi-fi and how we generate the data, because it is fundamental to our technology. And the first thing I would say is that so much of our, our capabilities really rely on the smart cell. And you'll see that on the left of the screen. That is where we do all the sequencing. That is where we watch single molecules of DNA extend in real time and really do the sequencing for us. So that is our, the heart of our instruments, and we'll talk a little bit about the innovation that has gone into enabling these new products. The second thing about HiFi I would call out is that because we are watching this in real time, we really get the benefit of not only calling the bases, but also being able to use the, the kinetics of how the, the reaction is occurring to go and investigate things like methylation. And we launched a, a software update earlier this year that enabled methylation calling on our instrument for free. So every run that you do on a, on a pack bio system, you get methylation calling out of the instrument for free, which is pretty amazing. The final part, because we're able to go round our molecules multiple times and we don't have a systematic error in the sequencing, we can really start to uh, create a consensus and get to those incredibly highly accurate reads that have powered so much of the technology. So if you remember sort of one thing about HiFi, please remember that it is a lot more than just highly accurate long reads. It brings us amazing evenness of coverage. It brings us the ability to do things like allele resolution and long range phasing, and it enables us to get methylation all out of that single data type. So this has really become the, the pinnacle of, of uh, PacBio uh, data and, and what we can generate with it. So that, that data type, HiFi, that I, I just went on about, um, truly has been enabling a bunch of amazing discoveries in the field, whether it's the first telomere to telomere assemblies, HiFi was there really empowering that work, the first single cell isoform catalogs that we'll hear more about today uh, that was really enabled through the MassSeq protocols. And then finally starting to look at the first directly phased methylomes with that software I, I just mentioned. 
HiFi has underpinned all of these and enabled these just in the last year or so. And we're excited that as we think about where we can take this, what it's going to enable going forward. So Christian mentioned that, you know, last or earlier this year, sorry, we, we launched a number of product updates really to improve the performance of the platform to bring forth and enable more applications on HiFi. So we were able to do things like reduce the amount of DNA that's required in the, in, the, in the sequencing reaction. So we're down to sort of one microgram per cell or three micrograms per genome. We're able to massively reduce the hands-on time and the number of tubes that are required. That enabled us to automate the product uh, so that you can run that on sort of a Hamilton liquid handler. We brought that methylation calling on instrument and started to include some of the new and emerging applications like AAV or gene editing QC workflows on the platform as well. But the important thing to say is that the work doesn't end there, obviously. We continue to push on all these fronts. And so I would call to sort of three key posters that our development teams have down on the floor today. The first really showing how we've continued to improve the methylation calling. So if you get a chance and you're interested in methylation, please go see Chris Saunders and he will tell you about how we've been able to really improve the performance of that methylation calling and even bring forth the ability to call on a single strand. So starting to look at hemimethylated uh, DNA in that uh, workflow as well. We've also got a poster that continues to expand on the uh, automation front and rolls in the extractions that we got from circulomics when we acquired them last year. And that really goes and shows how much you can really scale and implement HiFi in a lab. And you'll see uh, protocols that allow you to go all the way from extraction through to sequencing in an automated fashion. And then finally, uh, Juniper has a wonderful poster that really goes into how we can use HiFi and some of the newer algorithms that have come out of, of the group to really improve variant calling and discovery of things like de novo mutations in different samples. So three amazing posters with amazing work that's continued to build on the great releases we had earlier in the year. As I said, though, we're not doing everything ourselves. We have created and, and partnered, and we announced this actually at JP Morgan earlier in the year, but really have brought uh, targeted sequencing to the long read platform. So all those benefits that you get from HiFi, you can now do in a targeted fashion. And excited to say that uh, with Twist in partnership, we've been able to release a number of uh, predefined panels that really go after some of the most key applications. So on the, on the left, you can see there's a PGX panel that would enable you to do 24 samples on a single smart cell. And so one run, you're able to assess PGX for 24 samples. We also have a, a dark genes panel of about 400 genes that really fills in all the gaps you find from short read whole genome sequencing. So if you want to supplement your short read sequencing, we have a panel there where you could run four, uh, four samples on an individual smart cell and really go after all those genes, continue to get great, uh, great hi-fi data, as you can see on the right there, evenness of coverage, long range phasing, no dropouts, all those things that are so important when it comes to assessing these challenging regions of the genome. The other product that we announced at, uh, at JP Morgan and actually began shipping or began taking orders for just this week is uh, a truly remarkable product that we've worked on with both 10X and the Broad Institute. So excited to have Aziz here to talk through as one of the, the key uh, inventors, honestly, of this technology. But the ability to now do single cell isoform sequencing on a long read platform at scale is truly amazing. We're able to, uh, through this kit, uh, run and actually get about 40 million full length isoform single cell reads off an individual smart cell. And so at that level, we're really going to see some amazing biology come through. I'm excited to see Aziz present on this later today, so I won't touch on it too much. I would say, though, that both of these products are being discussed in our booth later today. So again, plenty of opportunities to go and learn more, but amazing things that are coming out and really leveraging that power of hi-fi. That all said, when we started and, and were thinking about long reads and what we could do with them, we knew there were certain applications and sample types where long reads don't make sense. Now, certainly for a lot of things that we are doing in this room and people are excited about, long reads are often going to be the way to go. But this is really the logic that came in when we started thinking about what would we do with a short read sequencer. And so as we started to look at uh, short read technologies out there, we really went and looked at what would that bring, what applications would that enable, and how would we think about bring that technology in-house. And the thing that we realized is that for all the applications that we really feel would be benefited by short read sequencing, accuracy matters. 
And so we really went out and went looking for what is the technology that's going to give us the best accuracy of all the short read sequences out there. And that's what took us to Omnium. And so at AGBT earlier this year, we did go through, and there's a, a link up in the top corner to, to see our presentation from our CSO, Jonas Korlach, talking through SBB. And at that time, we shared what are the fundamentals, how does it work? We shared how does SBB benefit when it comes to overall performance and looking at things like uh, whole genome sequencing and some of the more challenging regions that you can sequence through, such as long homopolymers and, and low complexity sequence that SBB really benefits from. But coming out of that talk, we really got three asks. Tell me more about when the product's going to ship. Tell me what it's called and tell me how it works in, uh, in low frequency or rare sort of variant discovery. And so I'm going to attempt to go through that today. But first, I really do want to introduce the new short read sequencer from Packfire. So meet yeah. Onsor, our new short read sequencer. Um, I could not be more impressed with how this product has come together. It is truly amazing to see what we've been able to accomplish in just a few short years of bringing this SBB technology to, uh, to product. And so Onso as a, as a product will start shipping in the first half of next year. We'll begin taking orders uh, in the first quarter. But just to give you some specifications, and I'll talk through the performance we're seeing in-house today. When we ship, we will uh, launch with the capability of generating four to 500 million clusters or million reads on an individual flow cell. We'll have 200 and 300 cycle kits, so you could do single read 200 or paired N150 kits. But importantly, our data quality remains best in the world. So you're gonna get uh, greater than 90% of bases at Q40, Q40 or greater accuracy. And I'll show you how that really plays out when we start looking for uh, mutations in ctDNA, et cetera of why that, that is so, so important. And then finally, knowing that there is a lot of uh, applications, a lot of workflows that have already been built around existing short read technologies, we absolutely will have a conversion kit that allows, enables you to take your existing workflows and libraries and run them on Onso and still get those benefits of 90% uh, of bases above Q40. So one of the experiments, as I said, that was really asked for when we, we came out of AGBT was how does this platform perform when it comes to needle in a haystack or CT, DNA, low frequency variant detection type applications. And so what we set about doing is to take uh, a known sample, so the Seracare CT, DNA V3, create libraries using uh, Agilent Sure Select Comprehensive Cancer Panel, and then split that library. Half of it is gonna go sequencing on the Onso platform, and we're gonna use our conversion kit I just mentioned. The other half is going to go out and be sequenced on, a, on another uh, technology for short read sequencing. And then we're going to compare the data. And so these four samples that we ran really span the range of 0.05% of to 0.5% allele frequency. And so what you can see from the same library in Magenta is obviously the, the SBB technology, so Onso. In uh, pumpkin orange, shall we say, is SBS. <laughs> and you can really see the difference that that accuracy brings at the same amount of sequencing. So this is 6,000x coverage. And what we're looking at here is the sensitivity to detect these rare variants at 0 0.05, 0 0.1, and 0 0.25. And you can just see how quickly the SBB technology comes to light and enables you to really detect these uh, low frequency events. So to dig a little deeper, because obviously a picture's worth a thousand words, we went through and had a look at this. And so this is the, uh, the SBS data at 6,000x. And what you can see on the right is what the pileup looks like. What are the errors that are coming through? 
And so you see that the, the actual uh, variant we're looking for is that C base there. There's nine counts of, of that read. But there's also three A's, five G's, and then 5,700 odd uh, T's. And so calling in that level of, of error becomes incredibly challenging. Contrast that with SBB, there are no other calls. It is 100% calling the, uh, the wild type and the, the variant allele. The other thing that we did though was to say, okay, well, this is why people generally use UMIs. You go through, you do a lot more sequencing, you collapse it down. And so we sequenced to about 24,000 X on the uh, SBB technology. And you can see there, oh, sorry, on the SBS technology, and you can still see that in the SBB, there is no counts. This is a, a reference position. In the SBS, you can still see those errors coming through. In fact, you're seeing 11 errors in that SBB, even with the collapsed UMIs coming through. And so while the UMIs do help recover some of that performance, you can see that it takes four times as much sequencing, and you still don't get to the level of performance that we get from SBB. So we are absolutely thrilled to see what we can do with this technology as we bring it out and show that this accuracy really does matter. I would point out that this position that we're looking at that should be wild type, that's BRAF V600. So again, this is the kind of thing you don't want to be seeing errors and making false calls. So what we announced this week as we've gotten through to this point and seen fantastic data is the, uh, the kickoff of our external beta. So our partners at Broad, uh, Corteva, AgriScience, and Wild Cornell are participating in our beta testing. Those instruments will start shipping out shortly. We'll progress through that, and as I said, begin taking orders for the platform in the new year, and then shipping in the first half. So we're really excited. Onso is down in the booth. Please come down and see it, learn more about it, but that accuracy is really game-changing when it comes to these applications. But as I said, you guys know us sort of as a long-read technology, and the biggest thing that you've been asking for is, how are we going to address those two challenges of throughput and scale on the long read technology? And so, because apparently we like to do crazy things like launch two sequences in a week, uh, I'm excited to introduce our new long range sequencer. So welcome to Revio, our new long read sequencer. Revio is going to enable hi-fi sequencing at scale. And as we've uh, been discussing uh, over the morning, this new product is really going to usher in a new wave of hi-fi applications. The platform is capable of 100 million ZMW sequencing at once. Our run times are down to 24 hours. So for the first time in PacBio's history, we've decreased the run time to better align with your workflows. We're going to get 360 gigabases of hi-fi data out of every single run. And we're still generating those fantastic hi-fi reads at 15 to 18 KB. So Revio ultimately brings us about a 15-fold improvement in throughput relative to what SQL 2E was doing today in the same footprint. So it's certainly bringing us that scale. We're able to sequence uh, four, uh, four smart cells at a time in that 24-hour period with 25 million ZMWs. So those four stages work together to get you that 100 million ZMWs. We've radically improved the workflow. And again, in the booth, you're able to go through and see this, but we've reduced the number of consumables by 50%. We've given the ability now that you can come in while a run is ongoing and load the next run to get to continuous operation. And for those that have worked with us for a while, we've actually been able to remove nitrogen as a requirement from the system. So really simplifying how easy it is to get these products up and running. We've also just massively increased the compute power by 20-fold, brought GPUs on board, and that's enabled us to bring uh, Google Health deep consensus onto the platform to really get the greatest data quality out. The other thing we're excited to talk about here is obviously that when it comes to affordability, we're able to now generate a human hi-fi genome at 30x 
for under $1,000. So really changing the game when it comes to what HiFi can deliver. Ultimately, this gets you to a place where you can generate 1,300 human HiFi genomes per year. That's 15-fold more, as I said, than what SQL2E was doing today. At the heart is that 25M smart cell. This is really what's powering the technology. There's a lot of things that over the years of generating and creating an amazing technology like HiFi that we have learned. We've kept a lot of that the same. So when you see the product, we've been able to leverage a lot of the manufacturing capabilities, a lot of the stability improvements we've made over the last year, but then bring in a whole host of innovation around increasing the density of ZMWs, improving the loading efficiencies, improving the uniformity of, of illumination so you get great quality data off the platform. And for the first time, we're rolling this out as a flow cell. So that's what's enabling us to really do away with nitrogen and get this amazing performance. The work deck, as you can see here, is radically simplified. We've made the, the workflow incredibly easy. It takes about a minute to load the platform now, which is really a win for, for folks in the lab, and consolidated down about four different parts into one single consumable that you need to put your library in, load, and the system will do the rest. So a real fantastic win when it comes to operational efficiencies there. As I said, we have four stages in the system, so you can run four different experiments at once. So maybe you want to run a, a normal genome in one stage, tumor genomes on the, on the next two stages, and then maybe you want to roll out the new mass seat kit on the, on the final stage, really bringing together sort of a multi-omics view of this sample type. So those four stages work independently. You have the capability to design your experiments around it, which is really exciting. Performance-wise, it's still the same great HiFi data. So we're generating over 90 gigabases of HiFi per cell. As I said, about 360 gigabases from an entire run. Quality is right there where it has always been for HiFi, which is best in class. And for the first time, we're actually implementing a Q30 base spec. So you'll see that 90% of our bases here are better than Q30. So we are absolutely thrilled with what we've been able to deliver with, with Revio. The final thing I would say is that we did bring, as I said, deep consensus onto the platform. That's enabling us to really get those run times down and generate the highest quality of data off, off an even shorter uh, sequencing run. And so we're leveraging the latest NVIDIA GPUs to do that. And this is really giving us about a 20-fold improvement in terms of compute power. That's what enables us to do so much on this platform while the run is ongoing. So out of every Revio run, you will get your HiFi reads with methylation calling for that same great data type you've become used to from SQL2E. So these are our two new sequences, Revio and Onso. Uh, truly thrilled to have them both here down in the booth. Please go down and see them. Uh, obviously, I'm sure folks are going to be interested in pricing, so I'm going to tackle that really quickly. Revio, as we said, 779K for the instrument. 15-fold greater capabilities than what was being done on the SQL 2E today, and ushering in the $1,000 complete long-read genome with epigenetics and phasing. And then Onso, 259K, launching next in the first half of next year, but taking orders in Q1. Now that we have a portfolio of products, we can also do things like bundles, which is really fantastic. So if you're looking to sort of think about getting started with HiFi for the first time, we have the capability to put together Revio and SQL 2E for those applications that make sense to continue running on the lower output uh, SQL 2E platform, 849K for the two platforms. And if you take delivery this quarter, we'll throw in $50,000 worth of uh, 8M consumables to get you going and really help you see the benefits of HiFi. And then in Q1 for the same 849,000, you'll be able to get both Revio and Onso. So for less than some of the, the new on-market high throughput sequences, you can sort of get the best of both worlds, a long read and a short read sequencer that provides the greatest accuracy and best data out there. So that's where I'm gonna end. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Stacey Gabriel to come across and uh, really take over. Thank you, Dave. I'm not quite the same entertainment that followed the Revio announcement of last night, so <laughs> <laughs> you'll have to forgive me, but I'll do my best to entertain you for a few minutes. Um, so thanks for everybody for, for coming. Thanks to PacBio for inviting us to speak. So it's really great to be here. Um, I'm going to talk about biobanks and characterization of biobanks. Um, as you all know, genomic characterization of biobanks is really advancing now across the world, clearly with the UK biobank leading the charge, but you know, many other national efforts picking up. 
Um, these biobank studies will be most impactful if they are diverse in terms of the population they represent, if they're fully characterized at the genomic level, and if they contain rich clinical information. So what I'm gonna talk about is now turning our attention to applying long read sequencing, which is getting more and more tractable, especially with the announcement from last night, um, to apply long read sequencing in the biobank setting to really increase the completeness of characterization. So when I was thinking about putting this talk together, I was like, I used this slide for many, many times over the years. And the notion of this slide, um, I think the first time I used it was probably, you know, at some early ASHD meeting long ago, was that you know, really what we're striving to do with genomic characterization is characterize allelic series. So an allelic series is, if you consider it, at a single base level, when you alter that base, what are the phenotypic consequences? And so the way this, my spiel used to go as well, you know, used to be in model organisms, you, you would mutate, right, and then study the phenotype directly. And then I would say, well, that's kind of hard and we can't really do that in people, so what are we gonna do in people? Um, so the idea there was then became, well, we need to have complete characterization of the naturally occurring DNA variation in all of us, in, in sick people and healthy people and attach that to sort of clinical outcome. And that's the way we would move forward with characterizing the human allelic series. And back then I said, well, is it great we have arrays and we have exomes and short read genomes and so we're really getting a start at this. But what's exciting now to think about is the many different, if you flash forward now 10 years, the many different ways we can start to approach this problem of, of characterizing the human allelic spectrum. Um, we can, Think about base editing, you know, in cells and cell lines, and then directly sort of measuring the result of, of very specific perturbations. And of course, with the newer technology, like the one from uh, PacBio that has been announced and that we've been using, long reads enable us to have a more complete picture of variation um, in the human genome. So there's already um, growing evidence of, of what you get when you start to characterize um, human genomes using uh, long read technology. So here's some work that, um, that was published by the Human Genome SV Consortium, so a group that sort of sprung out of the thousand genomes effort. And you know, really clear evidence that you do find far more structural variance uh, per genome if you have long read information. The problem, of course, is that these studies so far have tended to be rather small, you know, so a handful of samples that you can characterize deeply. Um, they've tended to not be incredibly diverse, although the last publication from the HCSV did represent a, a, a really good um, cross-section from the Thousand Genomes Project. But um, and the, I think the other thing you'd say is that there's, not, there's also not been sort of a, a, a resource out there of available data, widely available data of many, many genomes sequenced, you know, with long reads. And so, We've been thinking about what we could do to sort of make a, a dent into that. And um, what we'd really like to do is, is address some of these gaps as part of the All, All of Us research program. So many of you know that the, All of Us aims to provide um, a genomically characterized resource of at least one million individuals that represents the diversity of the US population. Um, we now have an emphasis to really start to expand um, the data types, right, the different things that we can lay on to th this resource. And it is important and it is going to advance, you know, we hope the field because this data will be made available, right, to the research community and the data will be produced in such a way that it's harmonized and standardized and available to researchers all over the world. Um, the program is making great progress. Um, in you know, generating SNP genotyping on arrays and short read sequencing um, using Illumina technology. Uh, so we're a couple hundred thousand samples in already. The first data release of 100,000 samples has already been made available. Um, but we are now committing to apply long read sequencing um, to this program. So the hope here is that We'll have a couple different strategies I'll tell you about we're going to use, but that we will, with this data, be able to characterize structural variants, STRs, VNTRs, um, across the sort of the wide range of ancestry represented in the All of Us resource, um, as well as methylation. And um, there's all kinds of things we can already think about doing with this data, but another, you know, one really interesting thing that could come out is 
the ability to sort of do that sort of orthogonal sort of validation of things that come out of, of, the, of, the, um, of the clinical return of results that's also part of all of us. So the specific aims then in, you know, in adding, so when we think about adding long reads to the all of, of, of the all of us research, which of course won't be on every one of the samples yet, so we're gonna start with a selection of individuals from the cohort, and there's a few things we know right away that we wanna do. Um, enhance the discovery of potential pathogenic variation, particularly sh uh, short variants in individuals. Um, and again, the data can be combined because you're, you're going to have the short read data as well as the long read, like I said, providing this opportunity for orthogonal validation, but also a lot of, I think, interesting cross comparisons will come out of that. Um, we will be able to establish a large um, SV resource, structural variant resource, for genotyping and imputation into other data sets that are large and that can use all of us as an imputation resource. And, and again, getting back to my allelic series from slide one, um, we will with this be able to develop a much more comprehensive database of genetic variation, um, especially in those regions that are inaccessible by short reads. So what strategies, so how and why, you know, what will we decide to do as part of this program? So there's you know, choices we all understand you make in this kind of setting. You can either sequence lots of samples at a shallow coverage or fewer samples at a deeper coverage. And what we've decided to do is explore multiple approaches still as this program um, continues to take <clears throat> off. Um, we are gonna follow an approach of sequencing about eight to 10 fold coverage generating data off of one smart cell. And I'll tell you about some pilot data that's been generated um, at, by Hudson Alpha already that sort of help, has helped us guide this strategy. So we're gonna do about 10,000 samples that way to sort of get that um, genome-wide view using long reads. And the, our, our colleague genome centers at Baylor and uh, UW are gonna do more of that higher coverage, you know, 30x coverage on fewer samples, and then you know, over time we'll be evaluating um, what that trade-off sort of looks like. And of course, this plan was put into place before we knew about the Revio. <laughs> so uh, back to the drawing board, um, and we'll figure out <laughs> um, how we're gonna sort of maybe move in both of those um, axes uh, for the program. Oh, uh, here we are. Um, so I just wanna highlight that the very first um, really nice data set of, of all of us, of, of long read sequencing in all of us is available um, in the uh, researcher workbench that hopefully you learned about this morning in the all of us session. So this is a data set of around, I think it's 900 samples now that are all chosen as African American participants in the program. Um, this is again sequenced to about that eightfold coverage and it's, um, it's available um, both the raw data, the aligned reads, uh, small variants from deep, var small variants called by deep, deep variant and also structural variants as well. So what about moving on now to the, to, uh, the, the 10,000 sample project? So um, we spent some time thinking about how we might select such samples. So this is work I'm pointing out to from Kieran Garamella on our team. So he's um, looked across sort of the, the, the sort of ethnic diversity of the whole cohort, and I selected 5,000 samples that represent sort of that whole range, um, 3,500 samples that exhibit the highest amount of admixture in the cohort, and eventually we're gonna move on to some TRIO samples as well, um, as TRIOs sort of accumulate in the program. Right now there's, there's not a large number of TRIOs because um, kids aren't being enrolled yet. So, um, with those things in mind and getting ready to gear up, you know, the biobank for all of us is already starting to ship us these samples. We developed um, a high throughput production facility um, at Broad using the SQL 2Es. Again, we're gonna be back at our drawing board <laughs> given the new instruments that will show up in February. But uh, we do have 25 instruments in production right now. Um, this gives us a rate of production of around 400 smart cells every month, sort of allowing for uptime and allowing for the, the way the schedule is worked out. Um, so for this All of Us program, we aim to produce one smart cell, um, or we did at the time, um, for each of the samples to achieve that sort of lower density coverage. And we're also moving to a system of multiplexing, so you can multiplex samples together and distribute them over flow cells to really reduce any sort of chance of flow cell to flow cell variation that might impact the sample. So that, that is also um, going to be in production. 
So we've assembled um, sort of a whole workflow with a bunch of equipment that is, you know, supports the processing. And we're happy to tell you way more about this and the type of um, automation that we use. But essentially, it's 96 samples at a time. Um, throughout a month, we aim to, as I said, produce around 400 samples. The early data um, is, is going very well. As Christian said, the SQL 2E produces really, really nice sequence data. Um, we've really seen, I think, a terrific pass rate over where we, you know, might have been a year or so ago. So we're passing 90% of samples on a first attempt. Um, I'll note that some of those families were actually processing error in the lab, which is just one of those things as the process scales up, that's going to occasionally happen. Um, so it is very promising, I think, this initial pass rate and does, I think, speak to the scalability. Um, the average gig that we're generating per sample is around 30 gigs. Um, with a median hi-fi read length of 12.9 uh, KB. So that's great. Along with um, the data we've had to develop, and again, this is work led by Kieran Garamella at the Broad. I think he's somewhere here, so he could tell you way more about this. But he has developed um, a processing capability um, on Terra, on the data platform at the Broad, that takes the data uh, from the platform and does all kinds of things to produce a final call set. And so I, I point you to that um, for more information. And as I said, the data quality is very nice. The data we're get, getting off the SQL 2E. I'm not going to go into it here in the interest of time, but there is a poster downstairs, 2874, where we present uh, a framework and then some results for evaluating new technologies um, across one another. So please go check out Michael's poster if you're interested. I'm going to thank the All of Us Research Program for um, being, you know, ready and willing to take this plunge with us. Uh, there is a long read working group that's been assembled, uh, chaired by a few of the PIs at the center and comes together every week to talk about how this program is really going to scale up and kick off. Um, and again, amazing support from the program and from the uh, data resource center as well. And that's my team. Um, the, the team at the top are speci specifically developing the, the, uh, the new workflow. I'm going to be very busy incorporating a new sequencer in February. <laughs> but um, that's them. And I'm tr terrifically honored to work with that group of people. And I'm going to hand it over to Aziz now, who's going to tell you about another cool set of things that we're going to do um, with the PAC Bio sequencers. So thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so uh, it's a pleasure to speak at this very exciting PacBio workshop. Um, following such an incredible uh, set of talks and announcements, it's clear that we're in a transition transitionary phase for long-read genomics. Um, you know, similar to NGS in the mid 2000s, it, you know, we're witnessing sequencing platform companies and research institutions really come together um, to drive discovery with these new powerful sets of tools and. I don't know, for me, it just seems like, like this very beautiful time where we're working collectively under the same question of what's possible. And so my talk today on RNA isoform sequencing with MossSeq um, is uh, an example of this virtuous ecosystem at play. So at the top, you know, I wanna highlight that this work was led in conjunction with uh, my computational collaborators, uh, John, Kieran, Martosh, and, and Victoria. So traditional gene expression analysis is used to identify genes or transcriptional programs uh, of interest. More recently, the community has leaned into single cell and spatial um, uh, gene expression. Um, you know, this newly enables uh, us to understand or resolve these uh, gene expression features at subpopulation or spatial levels. Uh, this approach unfortunately fails to capture the diverse uh, array of RNA isoforms that uh, can arise from any one gene. So these different RNA isoforms arise from alternative splicing. This is a core regulatory process that diversifies the function of genes. And so during the maturation of mRNA, exons and introns are differentially spliced, and this generates mRNA isoforms that differ in their coding regions and or you know, untranslated regions. The effects of alternative splicing cannot be understated. This is a regulatory feature that modulates the physical coding sequence uh, for, for the protein, right? It also affects translation efficiency, transcript stability, 
and even mRNA and protein localization. On top of this, the vast majority of human genes undergo some level of alternative splicing. And so these are precisely the features that we should be capturing when we're talking transcriptomics. So to really drive this home, I thought I would share a metaphor that you know, I use uh, when trying to compare and understand the differences between gene expression and transcript expression. Let's see if my mouse works, yeah. So a gene can be thought of as a sentence with each word serving as an exon. In key places along the sentence, different words can be chosen, giving uh, different meanings to the sentence. Uh, so here we have a catalytically active or inactive kinase with or without a, a nuclear localization signal, or NLS. Um, oh no. Uh, <laughs> something has happened to the slides. Um, apologies. Uh, so this is supposed to show up in a series uh, <laughs> of multiple slides, uh, but something happened in the transition. Uh, but Essentially, uh, through alternative splicing, um, we actually uh, you know, pick various words at these junctures. And so we have two positions, each with two words. So as you guys know, that'll give us a total of four combinations, right? And so, uh, and so yeah, alternative splicing is that process that picks those words, or those exons, right? And so just going through the list of these, we have a catalytically active kinase with an NLS, a catalytically active kinase without an NLS, a catalytically inactive kinase with an NLS. Uh, it's cut off here, but a catalytically inactive kinase without an NLS. And so after alternative splicing, we have our fully formed sentences or our mature transcripts, right? And those mature transcripts code for these proteins. And these proteins now have different domains. Those different domains lead to different functions, right? And so let's just walk through what these different um, uh, protein isoforms look like in reality. So here we have uh, our protein isoform that has its kinase domain uh, and a nuclear localization sequence. Okay, so it can phosphorylate its targets and it's um, being targeted to the nucleus. So it's gonna target its nuclear targets. Uh, in this isoform, um, it has a kinase domain, but it's, it's lacking that NLS sequence is not getting into the nucleus, right? So you have a kinase that's working in the cytoplasm. Uh, and then uh, for uh, these isoforms down here, they lack the kinase domain. In this example, let's say that it can still bind to its protein partners. What does that make it? A competitive inhibitor, right? It's still binding, but it doesn't have the kinase activity. It's competing for binding with the kinase. So it actually has the inverse activity, right? Um, and then as well, you know, you can, with or without a nuclear localization sequence, where is it going to uh, be a competitive inhibitor in the nucleus or the cytoplasm? So these are clearly very different protein isoforms, right? And so um, when we think about transcript expression, this is getting us closer to mechanistic insights. This is bringing us, um, uh, you know, within a better position to uh, derive hypotheses, testable hypotheses, and really accelerate research moving forward. Um, I need to <laughs> go through these dead slides now. Okay, uh, at least this one works. So reflecting, um, you know, back on gene expression, what does it mean for a gene to be highly expressed? Does our sample have that active kinase variant or a competitive inhibitor? Um, is this protein acting in the nucleus or in the nucleus or the cytoplasm? These are key things to understand. With gene expression, we understand none of that. And so this is precisely the, le the level of information that we aim to capture with RNA isoform sequencing. And so here's a real example in single cell data. Here we identify CD45 as being ubiquitously expressed in uh, this population of T cells. When we're able to resolve um, uh, the CD45 isoforms, RA and RO, it's clear that there's differential subpopulation expression, right? This is critical information that we're missing uh, at the gene level. And so despite this essential role that alternative splicing plays in cellular regulation and disease, our ability to resolve these isoforms is very limited. And so the problem is illustrated uh, here in this figure. 
we have our prototypical gene, gene X, which gives rise to uh, many transcript X isoforms. Traditional short read lengths are insufficient to span the consecutive splice boundaries um, of these transcripts, and thus it's poorly suited to uh, resolve uh, the transcript isoform from which it came, right? But conversely, long read approaches simply sequence the length of the cDNA, and then you can unambiguously identify which uh, isoform uh, uh, the cDNA belonged to. So that's great. Um, but to enable read-intensive efforts, such as single-cell RNA sequencing, we first had to overcome the limitation of uh, the throughput limitations associated with long read platforms. And so to this end, we conceived of MOSSeq, um, which is a, an approach that programmatically concatenates cDNAs into um, uh, single molecules, uh, arrays that are optimally sized for sequencing on the PacBio platform. So that's around 15 to 20 kb, right? And so by linking these um, cDNAs into arrays, sequencing them, and then informatically deconcatenate them, deconcatenating them, we can boost the output uh, of um, each run by greater than 15 fold. So that's, that's a real uh, substantial boost. And so um, just dive <coughs> into some uh, single cell data that we generated, uh, close collaborator Moshe performed uh, 10X single cell sequencing on human tumor infiltrating CDA T cells. And from the same full length cDNA, uh, we processed that sample for short read sequencing, but also for long read MOS seq. Um, we observed highly concordant clustering in T-cell states ranging from stem-like to early activated all the way through exhausted. Um, to demonstrate the added value that MOSSeq uh, throughput brings, we performed a downsampling analysis all the way down to 1 million reads. And, um, and you know, it's really clear, uh, you know, the increase in... Um, uh, uh, clustering efficiency, as well as identification of differentially spliced isoforms. So throughput really matters. And uh, you know, finally, we took advantage of the distinct CD45 splicing patterns uh, known to be present across different T-cell states um, uh, to validate MOSSEQ's capacity to resolve uh, RNA isoforms. So we're excited to see that MOSSEQ not only recapitulates site seq findings, which is an antibody probe-based method for um, uh, protein detection. Um, um, but we're excited to see that MOSSeq actually has greater uh, isoform resolution. So uh, for example, the RA antibody, it only recognizes that A epitope on, on the uh, on CD45, right? Um, because uh, MOSSE sequences, the length of the RNA, can actually discriminate between closely related isoforms, CD45, RAB, and RABC, right? So we get, we get much more granularity here with the isoform calls. Uh, in addition, uh, we can, through MOSSE, resolve um, isoforms that, uh, you know, we didn't have in our antibody panel or of which antibodies don't yet exist, right? So, um, so that, that's, a, that's a really key a key feature of MOSSeq and, and our ability to resolve isoforms. And as was announced earlier, PacBio uh, is offering um, you know, their new MOSSeq kit. And so uh, the production teams have done a, an absolutely stellar job at refining MOSSeq. And um, you know, they increased the fraction of full length arrays and integrating array generation with downstream library construction. They have wonderful bioinformatics tools. And so we're super excited to see um, how the community will, you know, leverage MOSSeq and, and all the findings to come. And shown here is uh, a sampling of how we're applying MOSSeq at the Broad. Um, so uh, obviously we're keenly interested in identifying alternative splicing in the context of development and disease, population, uh, GWAS and SQTL studies, uh, plenty of efforts around proteogenomics and neoantigen identification. A lot of exciting opportunities in functional genomics, uh, and of course, transcriptome reference generation. Uh, we're excited to announce that the Broad, specifically the genomic platform, have productionized MOSSeq. And so interested researchers are able to submit cDNA libraries for uh, a range of sequencing applications. So if you have bulk cDNA libraries, 
um, 10x single cell libraries, either five prime or three prime, spatial libraries, targeted amplicon libraries. Uh, we're able to handle all of these. So if you're interested, you know, please reach out to the genomics platform, uh, genomics at Broad, for, for additional information. Um, yeah, and, and finally, uh, I would just like to say that this work was a collaboration across multiple labs and platforms at the Broad. Uh, again, I want to thank John, Kieran, Maritash, and Victoria for, for leading uh, these efforts with me, uh, Stacy and Niall for supporting the productionization of MossSeq, and it is a real pleasure to work with many researchers that make science at this scale possible. Uh, and uh, our sources of funding, notably Spark, for, um, uh, for, for providing the seed funds for MossSeq development, and then PacBio uh, for subsequent um, uh, funding uh, for um, really driving exciting applications. Um, and then a shout out to PacBio and their uh, product teams for making an absolutely stellar kit. Uh, it's, it's, really, it's really a great improvement. Um, and yeah, you know, I just want to say it's amazing to work with diverse sets of individuals and entities all like under the same goal. Um, so we're excited. Uh, to continue to push the field of transcriptomics forward and can't wait to see what's next. So, yeah, thanks. Thank you.